Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the first in a series of Hangouts the EMDA has launched to address industry issues in the exempt market. The EMDA has recently celebrated its 10th anniversary as the leading national voice for the exempt market in Canada. Today's theme is crowdfunding in the Canadian context. And thank you all for joining us. I'm Sean Stanley. I'll be moderating the session, and I'm joined by a number of industry experts today, and I'll be introducing them shortly. I'd like to remind everyone that this webcast will be recorded and available at www.emdacanada.com. So, what is crowdfunding? The word refers to online campaigns that raise awareness about a specific project or business and solicit funds from individual investors. It's been made popular by such sites as Kickstarter and Indiegogo. In Canada, provincial securities commissions are debating whether crowdfunding that enables investors to take an equity stake in a business should be permitted. While they weigh the benefits and drawbacks, non-equity crowdfunding is taking off. Crowdfunding websites helped companies and individuals worldwide raise $2.7 billion from the public in 2012. That's an 81% increase from the previous year, and that's just released data today. So uh, equity crowdfunding made up the smallest chunk of that, providing a mere $116 million of that total. So where is Canada headed, and what should our regulatory landscape look like? Our first guest is Brian Kozak, the chair of the EMDA. Brian's a partner at the law firm of Castles, Brock, and Blackwell LLP, located in Toronto, Ontario, and he practices in the area of corporate and securities law. Brian is also a member of the OSC's Exempt Market Advisory Committee, which is considering new ways to raise capital in Ontario, including crowdfunding. Brian has spoken at numerous crowdfunding events. He's uh, presented a framework for legalizing equity crowdfunding to securities regulators across Canada, and he's actively involved with national and international crowdfunding associations and clients, including funding portals. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about crowdfunding today. So, Brian, tell us why the EMDA is educating folks about crowdfunding. Well, Sean, the Exempt Market Dealers Association of Canada, or the EMDA, is a national non-for-profit organization. We represent issuers, dealers, and other professionals in the exempt market right across Canada. As you mentioned in your introduction, we just celebrate our 10th anniversary, so we've been around a long time, and we're the leading association in the exempt market. The EMDA is keenly interested in promoting capital-raising exemptions across Canada, and crowdfunding is one of them. Our chief concern is that there's an access to capital or funding gap in Ontario, Sean. Other than raising money under what's called the private issuer exemption from, say, family and friends, um, you can only more or less raise money from accredited investors in Ontario, and this is extremely difficult. In the OSC proposal that was uh, released last December, it said less than 4% of investors in Ontario and in Canada qualify as accredited investors. 96% of the population is denied access to the exempt market. Surely we have to democratize the exempt market and let more people, the public, invest. And we need to do it in a right, balanced way. This will raise more money for businesses, create jobs, and also provide access to investment opportunities that were previously denied to the public. The MDA has been looking at how the exempt market dealers can sell securities on the internet for about two years now. And uh, crowdfunding represents, again, one way of doing it. In fact, in uh, the first quarter of this year, uh, the MDA prepared and published our crowdfunding survey, and we encourage viewers to go online to look at the survey results. We also worked with two other associations, the National Crowdfunding Association of Canada and North of 41, a cross-border VC association, to develop their own crowdfunding surveys. Okay, so uh, we also have Marty Gunderson, and Marty's Executive Vice President of Investment Capital for Productivity Media. Productivity Media provides individual and institution access to investment opportunities in film and television productions. Visit the website at www.productivitymedia.com. So currently, Marty sits on two voluntary boards in the investment industry, the Exempt Market Dealers Association of Canada and the National Crowdfunding Association of Canada. So welcome, Marty. Can you tell us more about the NCFA and crowdfunding? Sure. Thank you, Sean, and thanks for this opportunity. 
Uh, the NCFA is a nonprofit association advocating on behalf of all stakeholders in the crowdfunding space in Canada. Our mandate is to create a vibrant hub of participants, including businesses looking to raise capital, uh, portals looking to offer crowdfunding opportunities, and professionals looking at providing services to them. Uh, we are an inclusive and support both uh, technology-based companies and non-technology-based companies like uh, creative arts, uh, creating movies and such. Uh, our website at ncfacanada.org uh, has a directory of uh, pretty much all the portals in crowdfunding in Canada and also has a number of resources, free resources that will provide um, uh, a ways of learning. Uh, again, uh, feel free to visit that site and join us on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, Google+. Okay, so uh, Stephen Harrington is up next. And Stephen, you're a manager with Deloitte Consulting, an author and presenter on the future of work, the technology fundraising lifestyle in Canada, and crowdfunding. You recently co-authored a paper on crowdfunding as part of Deloitte's technology, media, and telecommunications 2013 predictions. So where does crowdfunding fit into the future globally? Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I, I wanted to mention when thinking about crowdfunding as a trend, we need to consider three things. Uh, and actually, I'd like, to, I'd like to check with you on the numbers that you mentioned off the top because ours don't, don't quite match up. Maybe we were a little more conservative in our analysis back in the fall. But the first thing to keep in mind about this as a trend is that it's, it's a fast-growing type of fundraising. Across all the types of portals, uh, we're looking at $3 billion worldwide in 2013 through fundraising, and that's doubling what we saw in 2011 at $1.5 billion. The second thing to keep in mind is that crowdfunding is more than one thing. You'll often hear to it referenced, and you'll think of it as strictly equity-related. That's, that's big in the news right now or you may think of it as, as, as a reward-related portal. Big names like Kickstarter sent us in that direction. I think what's useful is to look at that $3 billion and how we expect to see that break down uh, per portal. Some folks are surprised to find out that lending portals are actually by far the largest category. Uh, and these are portals that are funding loans, uh, largely to consumers, in some cases to business, and those portals are expected to do 1.4 billion in 2013. That's up 50% over 2012. Reward is the is the next largest categories, and that's where investors are are rewarded often by pre-selling inventory, but often with something creative. One recent example was a, a movie based on the popular TV series Veronica Mars sought funding. They sought two million, and so far have raised 4.3 million. And in return for the, the, that movie fundraising, investors were offered anything from a, a copy of the script uh, to a digital copy of the movie upon release uh, to a speaking part. The reward category we expect to do about $700 million in 2013. The next category is donation. It's a little bit hard to delineate sometimes the difference between uh, reward and donation because really donation is a reward but the reward is that sort of knowledge that you've supported a worthy cause uh, or you know it, it may be strictly charity we expect that portal to do more than 500 million in 2013 and finally equity or venture capital portals they're they're the smallest by a multiplier <laughs> Uh, we expected them only to do 50 million in 2013. This isn't to say that equity portals don't deserve the credit and attention that they're getting, but it's certainly to say that it's not uh, a proven model. And one, the third thing, the last thing to keep in mind when thinking about this as a trend, uh, is to keep it in context. Uh, even if portals smash through our predictions and do five or six billion dollars in 2013, Venture capital, in comparison, still does about $40 billion in fundraising annually. So if you're an entrepreneur thinking about where you're going to get that injection for, of cash, if it's not round A or round B, you may still be looking towards venture capital in the foreseeable future. And, you know, and to put it one other context, thinking about it in comparison to charity in that donation portal example I gave, uh, charities raised about $300 billion in 2011 in the U.S. alone. So there's a long way to go in comparison to the context and comparison. 
Yeah, those are good points. So given the buzz around equity, some people might be surprised to hear that uh, reward and lending portals are so large in comparison, as you're pointing out. So do you expect that trend to continue, or do you think we're going to see a change in 2013, 2014 going forward? I think the, the future for equity relies on two really critical contingencies. The first one is regulation. Even after the dust settles around regulation in the U.S., the question is going to be whether or not uh, the appropriate balance was struck between those rules that are going to protect investors while still remaining attractive uh, as an opportunity for <coughs> issuers. And, and of course here in Canada, if we're going to talk about the Canadian context, we have a more fractured regulatory uh, market that we're going to have to, to think about. All that said, we did hedge our bet a little bit in our prediction, <laughs> by actually a lot, uh, and said that though we expect 50 million in 2013, if U.S. regulators find that perfect balance, we think it could be as much as a billion dollars in equity portals in 2013. But this, the second contingency I think we should sp spend some attention on is, is the consumer behavior element of the way crowdfunding portals have worked so far. If you think about the Pebble Watch example, uh, people wanted this great digital watch. It was, it was supposed to raise, I think, 100000 It ended up raising $10 million. Not, I think, because people were looking for an investment, but because they wanted a really cool new watch and they wanted to get it first. That's a consumer behavior. And, and the question is, if you were to offer those same people an investment opportunity in that company, how many would shy away? Will equity, in other words, draw the same crowd uh, that, that the other portals have already shown they can? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, maybe we can get into the legals of crowdfunding a little bit. We have uh, Brian Kozak, who's the chairman of the Exempt Market Dealers Association of Canada and a partner at Castles Brock and Blackwell LLP, as I mentioned earlier. So Brian, you're the lawyer in the group today, and we'd like to understand the framework that's been proposed by the OSC to legalize crowdfunding in Ontario. But before we do, can you give us a quick update on what is happening in the United States with crowdfunding? Sure, thanks, Sean. Uh, my simple answer is nothing at the moment. But let me kind of go back uh, to April of last year, April 5th, when the U.S. Congress passed the JOBS Act, and Title III sets out a framework to legalize crowdfunding in the United States. It's not yet the law in the U.S., and the SEC was supposed to have final rules and regulations in place by the end of last year. However, it's not happened, and many in the crowdfunding community here and abroad are concerned about the delay. Other than sometime in 2013, Sean, no one knows for sure when the crowdfunding rules and regulations will be published in the U.S. However, certain recent developments have occurred that I just want to mention. For example, FINRA, the body that regulates broker-dealers in the U.S., has requested those interested in crowdfunding to submit an application form mm -hmm. so, so they can uh, gauge the pipeline of future portals and understand the various proposed business models. Also, just the other week, uh, the SEC published two no-action letters involving fund Funders Club and AngelList. These are two funding portals that sell securities to credit investors. Although some crowdfunding purists may argue that this is not selling securities to the public or crowdfunding, it's a step in the right direction, Sean, in that it involves selling securities over the internet, albeit to more limited public, being accredited investors, which is a subset of the public. Okay, so thanks, Brian, for that update. Now, on December the 14th, 2012, the OSC published a request for comment on a number of new ways to raise capital that included crowdfunding, mm -hmm. with a comment period that ended on March the 8th, 2013. So the OSC received about 100 comment letters, which people can find on the OSC's website, and had various public consultations and meetings with a number of interested parties. So I understand the EMDA has been actively involved in education and information about crowdfunding. For example, in February 2013, the EMDA and the CVCA held a crowdfunding conference at the National Club here in Toronto. With over 200 attendees, and that included staff from the OSC and the New Brunswick Securities Commission. And my understanding is that it was a great event. Now, you're doing this Google Hangout to provide more web-based information for those who are seeking to understand crowdfunding in the Canadian context, which brings me to my question. Brian, how are investors protected? How are companies looking to raise capital regulated? Lastly, how are funding portals seeking to host issuers who seek to raise capital on their websites to be regulated as proposed by the OSC? In other words, give us the nuts and bolts of the OSC's proposed crowdfunding framework. 
Thanks, Sean. Let's start off with what's most important here. How do you protect investors under the OSC's proposed equity crowdfunding framework? And I want to identify five things, just so our viewers understand what are the nuts and bolts. First, investors can invest more than $10,000 in any 12-month period and not more than $2,500 in any one deal. These are bright line tests. They're not based on income or assets. This is to keep it simple for everyone involved. Second, investors must be provided with an offering document called an information statement. I'm sure just like on Kickstarter, you're going to see videos and maybe even responses uh, from management through blogs and other social media. We can probably expect that as well, but that specifically is not mentioned in the OSC proposal. Three, investors are going to have a statutory right of action to sue a company for a misrepresentation in that information statement if they get it wrong. So there has to be some accountability by these companies. Four, investors have a two-day cooling off period after uh, which uh, they can get their money back if they want. Lastly, investors must sign a risk acknowledgement form, it could be a crowdfunding risk acknowledgement form if you will, which they confirm that they fall within the investment limits I discussed uh, uh, a moment ago. They understand that they can lose their entire investment and that they can bear the loss and they understand that uh, these securities are illiquid. It's not like they're sold on a public stock market. Next, let's look at the issuer or the company and how it's regulated under the OSC proposal. The proposal applies to both public and private companies, but not investment funds. Two, companies can only raise up to $1.5 million in any 12-month period. These companies must be established under Canadian law and have their head office in Canada. And as I previously mentioned, companies must provide investors with an offering document called an information statement. It has to include information about the financing itself, the company, and the portal. In terms of financial statements, if less than half a million dollars is raised, only management certified financial statements are required. If more than half a million dollars is raised, the financial statements must be audited. Next, the company cannot issue complicated securities or complex securities, just basic common preferred shares and debt securities linked to a fixed or floating interest rate. Next, companies can't advertise the offering except on the website and on the funding portal. Uh, however, companies can use social media to direct investors to the portal or website. And lastly, companies must provide investors with annual financial statements and keep certain books and records. Lastly. Let's look at how portals or funding portals or the websites, Sean, are regulated. And I think it's simple to say that there's not a complicated or set out regime that is presently set out. And the OSC wanted to get feedback. It does recognize that selling securities on the internet triggers registration of some sort, whether it's as a dealer or advisor. And they asked the, the public to provide feedback of how this portal should be regulated and be subject to the purview of the OSC. Now, whether it's going to be a full dealer or something less than a dealer or advisor, in terms of a restricted dealer or advisor, that's to be seen. It's really going to depend on the business model. I know at the MDA, we don't believe there's a one-size-fits-all solution in terms of regulating the portal, again, because they're different models. <coughs> Lastly, the portal is going to play a very key gatekeeping role, and this kind of ties into how it's going to be regulated. And they're going to have to take reasonable measures to reduce the risk of fraud. That's going to include obtaining background and securities enforcement regulatory history checks on the company and each officer, director, and significant shareholder of the company. Other than that, everything's kind of still up in the air, and it will depend on the model and a dialogue with the OSC of how they think the portal should be regulated. Sean, that's really the nuts and bolts of the OSC's proposed equity crowdfunding model. Okay, so Brian, I understand the OSC has finally proposed a new offering memorandum exemption for Ontario that's based on their crowdfunding framework. So what is the OM exemption and has the OSC got it right? Sean, the OM exemption currently used in Canada requires a prescribed form of offering document called an offering memorandum and a risk acknowledgement form that has to be provided to the investing public before they can invest. Uh, under this, the prospectus exemption, really the public can invest and that's the important point. There are two models involving the OM exemption that uh, people need to understand. There's one model we call the BC model and another called the Alberta model. The BC model allows any investor to invest as much as they want, uh, while the Alberta model limits investments to the public to up to $10,000 unless they're what's called an eligible investor. Uh, some people call that a baby accredited investor and it's based on income and asset thresh, uh, thresholds. 
Ontario is the only province, Sean, that does not have an OM exemption. The EMD has been lobbying the OSC for quite some time to introduce this exemption. So we're excited that the OSC has finally proposed a form of OM exemption for Ontario, but unfortunately, the OSC's proposed exemption bears no resemblance to the OM exemption currently used in other parts of Canada that I just briefly discussed. As presented, the EMD believes the OSC's proposed OM exemption appears to be more or less crowdfunding too, rather than a meaningful OM exemption. We call it crowdfunding too because it contains the same restrictions on the amount of capital that can be raised and the maximum size of the investment per investor as the proposed crowdfunding exemption. The only difference between the two is no portals involved and you don't necessarily have to use a registrant to sell securities. It's not much of a difference if you ask me, Sean. But if we look at it practically, what does this mean so people have an understanding? As a result of these limitations, a company will need to find a minimum of 600 investors to raise the maximum permitted offering of $1.5 million. Sean, I don't believe a company could realistically do this. They'd have to engage a dealer. There are a few dealers that would find this engagement worthwhile given the small size of the investments permitted and the proportionally small commissions. If you think about it, Sean, the cost of preparing an offering memorandum, issuing securities, maintaining records for at least 600 investors, uh, plus the cost of using a dealer is prohibited uh, when only a maximum of 1.5 million may be raised. Again, this is not in line with the OSC's general principle that business and regulatory costs should be proportionate to the benefits for the company, the so-called proportionate regulation. The MDA believes that the OM exemption proposed by the OSC will have limited use to companies requiring a significant amount of capital. In particular, it is unlikely that the proposed OM exemption would be a meaningful capital raising tool for small and medium sized companies, or SMEs as they call in Ontario. The MDA believes Ontario should pass a real OM exemption by adopting what we refer to as the eligible investor exemption. It's the Alberta form of OM exemption, but we've added the requirement to involve a dealer in the offering and publicly post a company's OM on its website or some other central repository. Okay, Brian. So now that we understand what's happening in Ontario, what's going on with crowdfunding in the rest of the country, in the rest of Canada? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because you think everybody would be on the same page, but unfortunately not. Shortly after the OSC released its paper, uh, members of the Canadian Securities Administrators, or CSA as it's called, other than BC and Ontario, provided a form of relief from the financial statement requirements under the OM exemption that I just discussed. Uh, again, Again, this OM exemption is not offered in Ontario, so you can see how the two regimes are not matching up. The CSA members did this to facilitate capital raising for early stage businesses and other small and medium sized enterprises while maintaining appropriate investor protection. The CSA's response to crowdfunding provides two things. One is relief from the requirement to obtain an audit on financial statements or other financial information. And two, relief from the requirement for financial statements to be prepared uh, using GAAP or IFRS. Uh, let's look at the conditions. Uh, there's four of them. One is that the company can't be a public company, unlike the crowdfunding one that Ontario proposed, an investment fund or mortgage investment entity or engage in real estate. Uh, the company can't distribute complex uh, securities. It's the same as the Ontario proposal. Uh, the amount uh, raised by a corporate group under the OM exemption uh, cannot exceed half a million dollars. And again, that's probably why they're providing that financial statement relief. And lastly, the aggregate acquisition cost of all securities distributed under the OM form of exemption to this corporate group to an investor in any 12-month period uh, can't exceed $2,000. The obvious concern here is that there appears to be an Ontario crowdfunding model, Sean, and a CSA crowdfunding model. But I'll say more of that in my concluding remarks. Okay, thanks. So let's move on to the VC perspective. Chris Arsenault is managing partner at Inovia Capital. It's an IT-focused venture capital firm he co-founded in 2002. Mr. Arsenault is a director of the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, the CBCA. Chris has been an early stage technology investor and entrepreneur for the past two decades and is an active supporter of matters that have significant impact on the Canadian tech and venture capital industry. So that includes Article 116, the C100, Startup Visa Canada, and equity crowdfunding. Chris believes entrepreneurship is a state of mind, not a title and not a profession. An entrepreneur has unique character traits that enable him or her to do amazing and sometimes impossible things. 
More information about Mr. Arsenault and Inovia Capital can be found at www.inoviacapital.vc. So Chris, why do you think many VCs like crowdfunding and some dislike it? And why are many of them indifferent? It's in thank you, Sean. Uh, it's interesting. Right now, the CVCA, you know, because we're, we're across Canada and have both private equity and, and venture capital <coughs> members, uh, the discussions going on right now with regards to crowdfunding is pretty mixed. Uh, we actually have three buckets. The first bucket being those who like uh, equity uh, crowdfunding. And the main reason why they like the idea is because they're able to see opportunities be funded by a new stream of, of early stage dollars going into projects or ideas that can actually bring an opportunity to a stage where it becomes VC fundable. Uh, so the risk is being reduced. And you know, if equity crowdfunding follows the same path as the non-equity uh, crowdfunding activities going on, you know, we're expecting that you know, over the next decade this is going to be pretty big. And basically equity crowdfunding brings a more efficient early stage capital uh, market together, so those are reasons to to basically like the this this new this new disruption coming into uh, to the market. There's a second bucket which are those who don't really care, and the reason why they don't care is because they're looking at the non-equity crowdfunding uh, activities and basically looking at movies, books, traditional businesses, mom and pop shops uh, attracting funding that has nothing to do with you know, the traits that a VC is looking for in terms of market dominance and, and leadership roles in, in specific segments. So they're not considering crowdfunding as actually being a threat of any sorts. Uh, but between me and you, Sean, uh, I can just imagine, you know, this big media company CEO back in 1996 talking with a group of, of bloggers about this internet phenomenon and saying like, okay, no blogging, internet, that's never going to affect my business. So you do whatever you want, and you know I'll take care of my stuff. I'm a real business, right? So disruption, disruption, which is what VCs are funding, uh, we're actually potentially going to see that disrupting disruption affect our own model and our own business model. So it's going to be quite interesting. The third bucket uh, are those who uh, who don't like it, and I think the the reason why you you won't like uh, equity crowdfunding is in part uh, based on what Brian was saying a few minutes ago where if you even if you have small amounts being invested in a company and, the, and that company does one or two rounds of crowdfunding and raises a 1.5 million dollars each time uh, you can do the math very quickly and end up with a few hundred uh, stakeholders in your company. So as a VC, when it, let's say the company <coughs> has proven his mo proven its uh, model that there's demand for its for its product, use crowdfunding to uh, to bring in the initial cash to actually build a business, and now they're going out for a growth round. Well, it's kind of scary to imagine that you're going to have to deal with 289 different stakeholders and run a, run after you know hundreds of signatures when it's time to negotiate an exit or negotiate another round of funding and then you, you kind of like take a, an, an additional step back and start thinking of yeah but how is this CEO going to manage all of the reporting and the communications with this large number of, 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 uh, of stakeholders so it's kind of scary on, on, on one front and at the same time it's an opportunity so if we just look back at the, the, the fact that the internet has disrupted every single segment that we know in the world or is disrupting it now uh, maybe this time they're disrupting disrupting the the VC model and the angel funding model so we're, we're, <laughs> we're on top of things in the sense that we're very involved uh, both as an organization uh, the CVCA uh, as well as a, as a VC firm Inovia because when we turn around and look at our last 18 investments just over the last uh, 16 months we did 18 investments every single one but one had an angel investor in it so why can't we believe that in six six seven years from now every single one of our investments won't have first been crowdfunded because of the, the opportunity that that represents yeah that's a very interesting point Chris thank you um, now we're gonna get the incubator perspective and Sunil Sharma is here with us and Sunil is the managing director and chief connector for extreme startups 
It's a world-class venture-backed tech accelerator based in the heart of downtown Toronto. Backed by five of Canada's premier VC funds, Extreme Startups looks to find, connect, and fund, and help grow Canada's next generation of technology companies. So with a rigorous program of mentorship, corporate partnerships, and hands-on coaching, Extreme Startups has become a sought-after program for early-stage companies in the internet, social media, mobile, software, gaming, and e-commerce domains, as well as other sectoral domains. Prior to joining Extreme Startups, Sunil was the International Director of Canada's Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, the CVCA, where he's been active in helping connect the Canadian venture capital and private equity industry with international funding partners and institutional investors. While working with the CVCA, and Sunil still maintains an active role with the organization, Sunil was on assignment from Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, where he served as a member of Canada's Foreign Service. And more recently, Sunil was appointed the head of consulate at Canada's consulate in San Diego, California. So Sunil, why do you think startups would <laughs> like or dislike the concept and the idea of crowdfunding? Yeah, thanks, Sean. So, I mean, we kind of look at it from the perspective that we're on the front line of what Chris was talking about in this entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem in Canada. Um, and it's interesting because we're looking to find entrepreneurs that have very very big and very disruptive ideas and to provide them with risk capital that's coming essentially from a group of investors that are looking uh, for their own source of deal flow and subsequent investment. So when we look at crowdfunding, uh, it's, it's coming into light in a couple of areas. One is that very often crowdfunding platforms are very investable businesses. Uh, they're very exciting, very growth oriented uh, um, opportunities and I'm sure that it takes one just to, if you just spend a few minutes looking at the a recent annual report of Kickstarter uh, or of Indiegogo, you can really start to understand the enormous business potential of these uh, platforms and even at Extreme we're starting to see a lot of applications that are coming at the crowdfunding uh, paradigm perhaps with different themes uh, a clean tech crowdfunding um, opportunity or one that's focusing on a different type of entrepreneur so it's a business into itself and it's a, a can be a very exciting one um, the second is that as a startup uh, often they're using crowdfunding results as an early indicator of future success so really you can start to look at market validation from the perspective of how well these campaigns are, are working uh, out there in terms of uh, up uptake. So, of course, Pebble Watch would be a, a fantastic example of a campaign that way over exceeded its uh, objectives and it's certainly validated the business idea uh, inherent in the, in the company. Um, interestingly now in startups we're starting to see a trend towards physical goods and uh, hardware related startups which I think do fit very nicely into crowdfunding campaigns. Another is the area of uh, 3D printing or uh, rapid prototyping. Again, a very hot, very investable space uh, at accelerator programs worldwide are seeing an influx of applications as this type of technology is really producing uh, enormous opportunities. And then another area I'll just mention is in wearables. So we have uh, uh, very uh, interesting sensor related technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see massive disruption with Google Glass coming on board and, and what that's going to mean. So these are the kind of um, startups that I think fit very well to a crowdfunding model. Not to say that digital uh, opportunities don't because certainly you can do a lot of pre-sales and pre-orders um, for digital or, or uh, internet based business models. Um, and then the last interesting idea from, equi from an equity perspective, and I fully agree what Chris was saying about the complexity of follow-on investment if you happen to have a, a multitude of, of individual investors, and that's something that I think the entrepreneurs are going to have to consider uh, very seriously before they launch their campaign with, it, with respect to what they expect to do after their campaign. Obviously, an enormously successful campaign may diminish or eliminate the need for venture-type investment, but many, many times it would likely work in parallel. Um, but I do think that uh, these type of campaigns can become uh, seen as very, very successful uh, if done properly. Uh, and so then the last point I'll make is that um, 
you could start to see accelerator or seed funds uh, really take advantage of the jobs legislation in the U.S. and start to raise their own funds through uh, disaggregated crowd model where mm -hmm. uh, individuals are starting to make bets on people like Chris and his, his propensity to find early stage uh, opportunities as an investor with his team of investors. And that might provide an opportunity for individuals to get involved with seed investing in a more sophisticated way with, a, with, with the involvement of a very proven um, investor. Okay, thanks Sunil. So uh, before we wrap up, let's move on to some final thoughts. So guys, uh, we'll go one by one and I'll, I'll just sort of shout you out by name. Um, are you for or against equity crowdfunding coming to Canada? And Brian, we're going to start with you. Sure, thanks. The MGA, we're for crowdfunding, but we want to make sure that it strikes the right balance between investor protection and fair and efficient capital markets. We think the OSC has proposed some really good ideas that are worth building on. The tough part, as I was mentioning, it's how are you going to regulate the portal? Um, I think there's a tension out there between there should be minimal to no regulation uh, to it should be looked at as a dealer. And I think it will depend on the business models and how the OSC approaches that. You know, I know that I mentioned earlier about uh, we have two models going on, and that's a big concern. You know, the OSC has committed significant resources to researching equity crowdfunding. I think they should be commended for embarking on such, a, such an undertaking. We believe that uh, the CSA members should work with the OSC in developing a national and harmonized equity crowdfunding framework across Canada, not just Ontario. Otherwise, it just won't work. Uh, we can't have an Ontario crowdfunding model that's different from the rest of Canada. So, Sean, what's the alternative? If we don't get this right, companies and entrepreneurs will go to those, those jurisdictions that uh, permit equity crowdfunding like the U.S. Canada will get yep. left behind. This is a really big concern. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, Brian. Thank you. And, uh, Marty, let's move on to you next. Yeah, uh, Sean, I, I think, um, you know, in a very short period of time, uh, if, we, uh, if we don't get this right, there's going to be a large sucking sound of capital coming uh, from the south, and, uh, and then money will be funneled to uh, ideas coming out of the states, as opposed to funding some of the best and brightest ideas uh, here made in Canada. Um, you know, obviously, collectively, we can't make that, uh, make that happen. We've got to work to see that uh, equity and securities-based uh, crowdfunding works here in Canada. Um, you know, we, we, we see other business models like the, the Kickstarter uh, and Canadian versions of such that are working very well, thriving, seeing uh, uh, in, in incredible amounts of capital raised. Uh, with uh, basically having signed t-shirts as rewards. Uh, the opportunity to provide uh, a expectation of profit for some of these uh, initiatives is tremendous and uh, I think we need to see this uh, go forward. Again, as Brian mentioned, with a balance between uh, uh, fostering capital um, opportunities for investors but also protecting investors as well. So I absolutely and my association is uh, fully on board with crowdfunding. Okay, thanks Marty. And uh, Chris, what do you have to say? Well, I personally believe that equity crowdfunding is inevitable. It's, it's here. It's already started. Uh, we're already doing deals uh, through angel lists and we're getting invited into deals with uh, crowdfund, another crowdfunding uh, portal that it just came out of Y Combinator. So, uh, it's here to stay. It's a question of uh, taking action and actually being part of the wave and guiding uh, the new regulations behind the securities I think is extremely important in order not to create too much confusion, confusion in, in, in the future for both the entrepreneurs as well as the investors. So, I already think that it is here and it will have an even bigger impact for non-IT opportunities than it will for what we're looking at as a venture capital fund. Okay, and Sunil, over to you. Yeah, quickly, I'll just say that um, we, we don't have an official position on it or haven't uh, canvassed our, our investors, but I do agree uh, that this is a, a trend that's here to stay and that it's overall very helpful. It, it provides an additional sort of uh, source of capital and it can de-risk uh, follow-on investment uh, very nicely if, if, if it's looked upon as an early market validator for a technology. Okay, thanks, Sunil. And uh, Stephen, uh, final word from you. 
and maybe because um, you're the lone guy who doesn't have his name and logo underneath him, <laughs> maybe just remind everybody of your full name and job title before you launch into your final <laughs> thoughts there. Right. So, uh, Stephen Harrington, manager at Deloitte. I, I, to me, I, I think that we really do need to look at how crowdfunding is going to work in Canada. Um, my personal concern is that given the scale uh, that we have in Canada versus the U.S., we need to be diverse in our approaches to crowdfunding. We need to make sure we explore equity, certainly, um, but reward. We need to look at regulation around lending as well, which is really leading the way so far globally. And, and I, I would say I think we stand a much better chance of this if we can get all the stakeholders in Canada behind this idea, uh, the venture capitalists, certainly um, financial institutions, both levels of government, uh, incubators that, that, that support the technology sector. If we're all pulling together, we have a better chance of building something where there is real evidence of early wins, which will con convince Canadians, con convince the crowd uh, to get involved, which we mm -hmm. certainly need in order for this to work. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Sean Stanley. I'm the editor of Report on Small Business at the Global Mail. I want to thank all of our guests for being with us here today. I want to thank the EMDA for having me as the host. I'd like to thank everybody out there who is watching and just let everybody know that this will now automatically be archived to the EMDA's YouTube channel where it can be viewed again and shared. This is a very hot topic. Uh, not just in the markets that we were dealing with today, but also in the media, and it will continue to be, and it's going to be very interesting to see where everything ends up. So thank you all again, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.